Today we are joined in the panel with uh, David Mwangi, an advocate of the High Court, and Oscar Okrero, a cyber security expert. And we are here to discuss concerns about data and privacy. So uh, my first question is to you, David. Um, we'd like to know what should I share with whom and how much data should I share? Personal information, personal data is all of those. And every, every citizen has a responsibility. The law provides the right. But then you have a responsibility. Every one of us has a responsibility to protect your personal data. Such that the question was, what should we disclose? The most minimum possible. If today you walk into, uh, maybe for example here at RMS, and they ask for my ID, I give them my ID. I'm given somewhere, not here now, but this is for context purposes. I'm given a book to sign my name, date of birth, ID number, phone number, time in, time out signature. Yeah, it's most common in accessing buildings here. Yes. Yeah. By just doing that, if I give my true and full information, I'm at risk. Because I do not know how much information, how much of that information is going to be used against me. Or where exactly they're going to use that piece of information. So to answer your question, please provide as little as possible about yourself. Either in print, either uh, where you record it yourself, or as you post it online. I would like to know in what circumstances am I right not to give my data? For instance, if I'm required to give my data to access a building, and in many cases it is said to be for security purposes, which we understand, but when am I right not to give it or to question? So the Data Protection Act provides for, ideally, what you can define as personal information. And that anybody who wants to use that needs to get your consent out of that. So there are other instances, say, where a government may want to, or a government agency may want your information. For instance, when they need to provide a public service. You know, you need to access your citizen. You need to provide your personal information. And there are also the instance when they are what they would call a public order. The police are probably doing an operation to flush out some thugs. So they need to be sure you're not one of them. So you may not have an option of showing your ID in that instance. And there are other instances. But for the sake of, say, um, just you accessing services, like uh, David said, you really need to provide very minimal information just enough to access that service because, and I think we are going to talk about that when the, 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 the new regulations for registering a SIM, at what point does a SIM and your DNA relate, you know, that's too much information for that service. So you really should provide as little as is possible to access that service. Beyond that, there are, there are recourse in law where if you feel um, your right to privacy being infringed, there are ways to go about that. But remember also, all the rights are not absolute. A lot of times, government have, and let me say there is no right that is absolute. Yeah. So there are instances when, say, a government may need to invade your privacy to provide a service that only government can provide. So in those instances, you may really not have an option. What are now my individual responsibilities as a citizen to protect my data or to ensure my data is safe? Be very strategic in your disclosure of your personal information. You cannot trust the next person whom uh, you're giving this information to or who will benefit from this information. The trade in personal data globally now is especially the black market data is so expensive it is equated to the trade of gold 
And as you, as you said, of course, um, more and more data is needed f uh, from us because that's what is being used in the e-commerce space. It's data that is being used to train AI models. And we are seeing what's happening right now with the rush for AI solutions. So we moved from uh, a time whereby all we needed to give is our ID numbers, the name of our chief, uh, to places where now we are required to share biometrics. If you look at the latest continuous voter registration, the IBC has introduced more ways of collecting biometric data because before it used to be um, the fingerprint. But right now, um, IBC is even doing iris scans in the latest uh, voter registration. So what does this mean for now privacy? So where your personal information is required by government, <sighs> biometric data is one that you can change. So if today my iris is scanned or my thumbprint is scanned and that information is with the government, it can be used against me, or it can also be used uh, in furtherance of my rights. I can be helped because they have my data, but this is the risk that uh, I can, my rights can be infringed because they have my data. Yes. Yeah, it's a tough balance. When we started, Oscar, you mentioned uh, the new CA, it's the Kenya Information and Communication Act, where um, uh, even though the CA said it, it hasn't asked uh, mobile network operators to collect biometric data, I did read the act and I could see one of the places that uh, someone who is registering your SIM card is supposed to fill is biometric information. So what's your take on this? Okay, so I'll look at it in two ways, but the first would be... Uh, you see, right now, most of what you do, be it academia, be it uh, business, be it even just in entertainment, it's done online, no? And unlike in the physical world, where we know that is so-and-so, this is so-and-so, in the digital world, it's very easy to impersonate other people, you know, because most of their information are online, so you can just use that and create a persona that interacts with you online. And I'm not even mentioning the fact that there are so many millions of bots online who self-generate and then in engage. Now, having said that, then for any government, it would be to their interest to at least assign some identification to these characters that are, you know, engaging online. So out of, I think uh, it is to everybody's interest that you know who is posting, blah, 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 right? Now, and... Um, because of the nature of the digital sphere, you really need to tie that identity to someone. And the easiest way and the surest way you can say somebody on X is so and so is probably attached to an ID. The ID can be faked. So probably you go ad a step further, biometrics, you know, because only you have your, fin uh, your fingerprint or your iris and everything else. So to the extent that that is the intention, then I think that that makes sense technically because you really need a way to prove it's so and so. Now the disadvantage of that is that um, assume that you need to, when I go to register my SIM card, I need to provide my DNA. And where do you register our SIM card seats at the Mpesa shops and every? What will they use to capture that? Do, are they well trained to protect? Because that is really sensitive information. You know how carelessly they handle that book with the transactions which ends up with the committee boys. Mm. Now imagine a new version of committee boys who have your DNA and now have that information. You get it. Mm. So the intention may be right, but I think in terms of practicality and enforcement, it may be a bit of a challenge because one, you need something to collect DNA. And then, of course, the systems to capture that, I don't think uh, in terms of cost, that would be justifiable or it would make any business sense. And our concerns are also coming up, how data privacy today is, um, I mean, data is used to silence dissent. What does this mean for 
the, our freedoms as enshrined in the Constitution. The best way to be safe, both as a group and as an individual, do not give information, like more information than you really need to access a service. If, say, you need to sign up for Facebook, who cares about your brother, your cousin? You list them and you tag them. So if I want to know them, I would even click on that and see what they look like and probably take their images and, you know, all that is not necessary. Um, when and to, to the extent that this information is used to target particular groups, I think uh, I will not speak to that. But the best way is to protect yourself and protect yourself by giving as little information as is possible. Because someone who does not know you cannot hurt you. Of course, if possible, always use VPNs. VPNs not only protects you, I mean, gives you the privacy from being uh, monitored and everything else, but it also secures your communication so that um, it cannot be tapped and, you know, decrypted and used against you. Other things, uh, you know, you don't, don't click on every link. There's always this Nigerian prince who still fools people, you know. Oh, I'm from Canada, want to retire in Kenya. I saw your profile. And people still click that thing. Uh, Oscar, maybe just briefly discuss the digital public infrastructure in Kenya. We saw on, Mon was it Monday or Tuesday, there was a serious hacking yeah. whereby all the government websites uh, went. So what happens in case of a cyber attack? And all my data is in those websites. So as an individual, you really should not be scared because um, I think from a public infrastructure perspective, uh, we are doing so well, doing so well in the sense that uh, beyond the enterprise protections that say your service provider is required by law to protect your communication, uh, there are legal controls around that to secure it. And then we also, as I mean, within government, there is uh, the DCI has a whole cyber security operation center that detects and responds to threats. I think the DOD also have the Moran defined and dedicated just for cyber security incidents response. And I think uh, CA also has the K KESAT that responds to all that. So I think from an infrastructure perspective, we are pretty much covered. Of course, there are always uh, lots of new threats that we have to adapt to. And I think me and you will know that governments are, at times are really big, so their response time can be limited. Take so much care about your personal information. It has gone to court so many times, except now in our case, but in other cases, um, where we are now able to trace, provided there is a certificate of electronic evidence, I'm able to pull out any information about you, that I think would be important in a certain case. I only have to produce a certificate of electronic evidence. Yeah. So if you had actually run away from something, but then we're able to see it from a certain CCTV, we pull it, mm. we bring it as evidence in court. Mm. Yes. And it is you who posted that selfie of yourself going in this direction. Yeah. Yeah. There is the AI demand for data. I mean, these systems are so hungry for our data. And I uh, remember earlier this year, Elon Musk, one of the big players in the technology sector said that um, we no longer have real data to train models. So there's an option for use of synthetic data. Will this maybe stop the hunger for data that is all around the world? No, it will not stop the hunger for data because only you can provide the information that you provide and it's interesting. So to an extent that say, how does AI models work? A lot of, generally AI is uh, you develop a model that you feed some information, then it reads patterns. And then based on those patterns, you give it new information. It tries to project a pattern based on its historical data. Now, what happens with synthetic data is that this is a program or a model that is created to provide information. 
or to generate data. So it therefore means that it provides data in a particular way or a particular type of data. So in terms of training AI models now on that synthetic data, it means that the models will be either overfits or underfits. Overfit is when the information, when I just explain the historical data, the model, and then the new data for projection. So overfit is when the information is too close to almost, it's, it's, it's almost just replaying, it's not making any new, mm -hmm. uh, new, patterns. yes, it's not creating any new patterns or new knowledge or information. Mm -hmm. The first thing, our information is not yet even digitized enough to be used for, to train models. Yeah. So we still have a long way to get to the point Elon Musk says that, you know, there is no more information. But whether or not that will stop the hunger for personal information, I would say no, because again, only you can be you. Yeah. And AI needs you to be you so that they can define who you are. Thank you, uh, Oscar and David, for joining us today. And to our viewers, you can find this and more on Citizen Digital. Thank you.